Ahoy there folks, I'm Captain Benzi and welcome to another episode of the Destroyer Pilots Manifesto, the series that aims to teach you everything you'll need to know about the various different destroyer hulls in EVE Echoes. In today's video, after a long hiatus of not having made one of these in a significant stretch of time, we're going to be taking a look at the Tech 10 Galente Federation Catalyst 3 Interdictor. After so long away from being able to make these videos, it is really awesome to be able to actually talk about some destroyers again and showcase them in action. The recent April balance update has brought some amazing changes to the Tech 3 interdictors and they are genuinely good ships worth flying in a plethora of different content now and that's something that I hope to showcase with this video. Of course, as usual, any fits showcased here are just starting fits. They're what I'm running, what I'm having fun with. You might decide that there are things that are different that you would like to change and would fit your playstyle even better? Let me know in the comment section down below and if you do enjoy this video please hit like on it, sub to the channel and ding that notification bell to make sure you never miss an update. Finally if you want to keep me doing what I'm doing and want to go the extra mile to help support this channel you can do so by joining me over on Patreon and indeed my Red Bubble merchandise store both of which are linked in the description down below as well. Anyway, with all that said and done, I'm too excited to wait too long on this one. Let's jump right in to talking about the Catalyst 3 Interdictor. The turret destroyer lines start at Tech 3 of each of their different empires, and from there they then climb all the way up to Tech 10, going through a Navy issue, a Guardian, and then the Interdictor line of vessels, and it's the Interdictors that ultimately form the top tier variants of these destroyers. Now of course, the Catalyst is the Galente Federation variant here, so we're going to go into their ship tree, and you can see the original Catalyst all the way down here at Tech Level 3. I've covered a lot of these in other videos elsewhere, today we are of course going to be looking at the Catalyst 3 Interdictor. This is a really unusual ship. I, I'm never quite sure if I like the way the Catalyst looks, if I love it or if I absolutely hate it. It's one of those it grows on me and then I'm like I'm not so sure. It looks like a wing with sort of an engine strapped to one side. Now of course this is in space so being lopsided doesn't matter, the, you know gravity's not really a thing here um, and it certainly plays into the Galente Federation style of sort of, well okay it plays into the Catalyst style of warp to zero and just blitz at absolutely everything. It also looks a little bit, if we zoom out and turn it sideways, like the Myrmidon fell over and shrank, or maybe the Myrmidon stood up and grew from a catalyst, who knows. Either way, it's an unusual ship design to say the least, and it is fairly polarizing, but we're not here to talk about the looks, we're here to talk about how this thing flies. Now, straight up then, we have a power grid here, 59 megawatts. This isn't humongous, it's not going to allow us to do crazy oversizing or anything like that like we can do with some of the other destroyers. It's sufficient for our needs, but it's nothing too crazy. We've got four high slots. It's excellent to get that fourth high slot back as of the April update. It gives us some really nasty firepower on this now. Four mid slots allows this to be versatile, good at tackling, which of course is what you would expect from an interdictor, especially if you're going to actually be fl uh, flying it to fill an interdiction role in a fleet. And four low slots gives us somewhat versatility available there in regards to things like weapon upgrades or tanking modules, that kind of thing. It's worth noting that the cargo hold capacity here, 1,350 cubic meters, is actually the same as a lot of the Tech 10 cruisers. That is a considerable cargo hold and means you can be out and about roaming and doing PvE content in this if you wanted to, or scooping up loot from your gate camps and things for an extended period of time before you have to disappear. It also means, of course, you can hold an excessive amount of fuel. Defences for a destroyer are pretty solid, nothing to write home about overall, 7005, most of which of course being a Galente ship is in structure, with armour closely following behind, shield lags behind at 1674, the other two are just over 2000 hit points each, it's what we expect from a Galente ship, and it's actually what makes the Catalyst 3 pretty useful in EVE Online for things like suicide ganking, and we can kind of bring that playstyle to bear here in EVE Echoes as well by not having to rely too heavily on shield or armor tank and actually being able to use the structure tank to our advantage as well with its full 33% across the board resistances. There's no weaknesses there to count on. 
as we go a little bit lower. Capacitors, of course, this is a destroyer, are pretty small, only 706 gigajoules, but it is a pretty good recharge rate for a ship of this size, 7.84 gigajoules per second. We can get this capacitor stable remarkably easy, and that's surprising, actually, um, as you'll see in a moment, as long as we're keeping to sort of standardized modules. The signature radius 40.9 is pretty small, it means we're going to take a little bit of time to lock onto if we're being targeted by battleships and things like that, and we've got a solid scan resolution ourselves of nearly 700 meters. That's 699 in total there, it's really nice and it scales well with things like targeting skills to actually give you some pretty sweet lock on times, especially against other frigates and destroyers, which is what is really going to help the Catalyst 3 interdictor be furious, like furiously terrifying. Um, I, I really cannot explain how much fun you can have in one of these. As we move a little bit lower, flight velocity is lower than some of the other options at Tech 10 for destroyers, but 381 isn't awful. It's not terrible, and if we're going to strap a micro warp drive on, spoiler alert, then yeah, we can actually get some pretty nice speeds out of this. The inertia and the mass leave a little bit to be desired, but again, it means that, you know, it's it's not awful. For a destroyer, we can still hold a pretty like standard orbit, probably not with the prop mod on, um, if we want to be able to do what we do. Um, but ultimately it does leave a little bit to be desired. It's a fairly cumbersome destroyer, which I suppose you can kind of expect considering it is essentially, as I said, a giant wing with engines strapped to it. If we look into the trait description though, being one of the turret destroyers, it has the roll bonus of a 25% increase to the small weapons range. In this case, it's small railgun optimal range. And being an interdictor, we have the ability to fit interdiction sphere launchers. I'm not gonna go too crazy talking about what these are. If you don't know what an interdiction sphere launcher is, do watch my Cat Scar Academy video on what interdiction sphere launchers are. Have your eyes opened into the true terrifying PVP potential that these ships can unleash. Looking at the skill bonuses, Advanced Propulsion Jamming, which is of course what you're going to be training into as an interdictor pilot, increases the sphere launcher active, sorry, decreases the sp sphere launcher activation time by 10%. That's 50% at full training there, Advanced Propulsion Jamming bonus 5, meaning that you can activate and launch more spheres in space um, that little bit faster. You can launch twice as many in the same period of time as someone who doesn't have that skill trained. Advanced Destroyer Command then gives us an increase of small railgun damage by 12.5% and small railgun accuracy falloff by 7.5%. Now here, this does actually suggest that snub-nosed railguns are going to be our friend. They do favor accuracy falloff a bit more than optimal range does. It's not quite as clear cut as strike cannons and uh, auto cannons, which clearly favor optimal and falloff, uh, like, uh, respectively. Here though, we can see this does favor snub-nosed railguns a bit more by increasing that accuracy falloff, and the small railgun damage bonus here is pretty monstrous. At full training, you're looking at 70 5% additional damage. That's taking the four high slots and converting them into seven high slots. And well, yeah, you know what snub-nosed railguns are like. You can anticipate what that's going to do. The first fit that I want to showcase here with the Catalyst 3 Interdictor is a PvP interdiction fit. This is heavily inspired by the fact that the Catalyst is often used as a suicide ganking vessel in high sec in EVE Online. Now, we may not have suicide ganking as a particularly useful strategy here in Echoes, but we can look to it for inspiration as to how to fly this thing. And basically the premise is that when someone drops on grid, we drop the bubble straight into their face, micro warp drive into zero, activate everything and then just pray that they're dead before we are. That is literally how we play this and you'll be amazed at how much fun you can have with this as long as you're not too worried about losing the occasional ship here or there if you gamble poorly. Ultimately, if you're willing to just enjoy the fact that something has exploded every time you fly this thing, well, that's, you know, that's how you're going to get the most fun out of it. Now, in order to pull this off, of course, we go for a micro warp drive here in the lower levels. You can go for a higher than meta level 5 here, as long as you've got the power grid to fit it. I just didn't have a meta level 8 or higher lying around at this point in time. Um, but of course, the best micro warp drive you have means you can close that gap, get into zero onto the target nice and quickly. 
and whilst you're on your way there, you're going to activate both of the Corellum C-type magnetic field stabilizers to give you a boost to what is already a fairly frightening 809.13 DPS. That, of course, comes from our snub-nosed railguns. Corelli C-type small uh, snub-nosed railguns, to be precise, 202 DPS apiece. Now, admittedly, they've only got an optimal range of just shy of three kilometers, so you really do need to close that gap quickly. The accuracy fall off of 4.2 means that once you hit seven kilometers, you're about 50% of the way there. That's the point where I'd be activating both of those uh, magnetic field stabilizers and really opening fire. Of course, being an interdictor, we need the interdiction sphere launcher. That goes without saying, pretty much. That's what's going to allow us to launch bubbles, make sure you have fuel in your fuel tank, in your uh, cargo hold, so that we can actually activate this. Finally then, for the mid slots, I've got a Nosferatu and a Neutralizer. These are designed, the Neutralizer of course is aimed to flatten their capacitor nice and quickly and switch off any of their um, active tanking modules. The Nosferatu helps me keep mine going a little bit longer whilst also draining them, and the web just slows them down so they don't escape quite as quickly. Why have I got a Mark IX stasis web of fire in here? Surely I have something better than that. I think it's because I, yes I have, I saved this early on, oops, and when I've gone back in whoops we haven't upgraded the uh, you know updated the save file there let's try that again a republic fleet stasis web of fire and yes i am going to leave that in the footage um that allows us just to grab our opponent as we start to close the gap it makes it harder for them to run away and with the interdiction sphere launched it means they can't warp either. Yes, micro warp drives are still going to be a thing. You might decide therefore that the neutralizer isn't what you want or the Nosferatu isn't what you want and you'd rather plug in something like a warp scrambler there and um, some hard point to switch off a micro warp drive and stop them getting out that way. Of course, for if you're going up against things like interceptors that can ignore the bubble, then yes, a scram is going to be very useful for holding them in place. Although, that said, most interceptors I tend to see roaming these days still run with three warp core optimizers. So unless you've got nine points of scram good luck stopping one of those bastards finally then in the low slots i've gone for a small shield booster over here again you can go for a larger than uh, veteran small shield go up to a meta level 11 or something like a gist dc type um i've gone for shield boosting because well even with the shield it's pretty actually close to cap stable we do pretty well on this with the micro warp drive off the nosferatu on um you actually are pretty close to cap stable and that can run almost ad infinitum that two minutes 41 doesn't really do the ship justice that's with the micro warp drive active and that really does chew capacitor these days for the nano core here in the bottom left i've only gone for a blue one it's all i had available and ultimately this is a fairly disposable ship so i've just gone for that additional 14.4 percent additional railgun damage courtesy of the catalyst monsoon 2 core these aren't overly expensive on the market compared to some of the other stuff out there but of course you could create something like a galente core um, or one of the serpentis veteran cores or things like that anything you fancy there just a nice cheap core to get into that low sl into that slot just to give you a little bit of extra damage. Now, as I said, this is absolutely terrifying. You basically find someone on the grid, you hit them with the warp bubble, you then micro warp drive to zero and unload 809 DPS into them. With both of those magnetic field stabilizers active, you actually clear the 1000 DPS mark, which is truly monstrous. Now to achieve this, I've gone for a collision accelerator and two burst aerators here into the rig slots. A just standard DPS setup here, hit them hard, hit them fast until they stop moving. And in the uh, engineering slots, I've gone for auxiliary thrusters, a targeting system subcontrol of three times two. This is so that we can lock on that little bit faster. And this is obviously so that we close the gap a little bit quicker. You can go for a polycarbon engine housing here. That's actually not a terrible idea as it means the micro warp drive gets you up to speed that little bit faster but ultimately i'm quite happy with a ship that has a cold navigation speed of nearly 600 meters per second that's before we put on a micro warp drive that's giving us an additional 550 percent velocity on top of that we've got a massive horrendous 809 cold dps going over a thousand dps once it's active our capacitor is a lot more cap, cap stable than it actually tells us here and our targeting Look at that scan resolution. Please just spend a second to look at that scan resolution. You can grab fast moving faction frigates with this. If you are quick and you've got a warp scrambler on hand, you can lock and scram interceptors that don't have stabilizers, of course. You can pretty much insta lock 
anything that you need to there. Then you just warp in, micro, uh, use that micro warp drive, get into zero, open up, and turn it into a smoldering pile of space scrap. Now this is where things are going to get fairly controversial, because what I'm showcasing here is a PVE fit for the Catalyst 3 interdictor. But hang on Benzi, it's an interdictor, that means it's a PvP ship, right? And why the hell would you use a destroyer in PvP when you could be using like battleships and the other big things that do things so much better? Well, I have two answers for you. One, not everyone wants to or can skill into battleships. If you're like me, you probably already have your frigate and destroyer skills pretty much maxed out whereas your battleship skills st still leave a lot to be desired. Also, you know what, a Tech 10 battleship costs a couple of billion, this entire fit sits below the half a billion, um, and sits below it comfortably. We're also keeping the same rigs as before, so you can swap to this, use it for PvE, and then when you want to go for a roam, just swap back to the previous fittings that we saw before. We're still using the same snub-nosed railguns in the high slots there for that monstrous 890 cold DPS. It's basically just the mid slots that have changed on this one, other than the micro warp drive going away and swapping out for a Corelli C-type small afterburner. Of course, using a micro warp drive in PVE, not overly recommended because you can't speed tank with it. Not that we're actually going to be speed tanking with this. We are using it just to close the gap to get into the snub-nosed railgun range. I actually turn it off when orbiting most things just because I find that the elliptical orbit caused by the terrible agility rating and the high speeds that this can output ultimately that elliptical orbit means that if you are on the zenith on the approach or the away part of that elliptic then you are at a lower angular velocity and more likely to be struck by turrets when that happens so I tend to just stick for the afterburner but it is up to you there. The mid slots get particularly controversial though. We're going to start with two stasis Weber fires. Again, this is just for holding things like interceptors and smaller frigates in place. One of these can be swapped for a scram if you're going up against stuff where you know the enemies are going to have micro warp drives. And we've got a small energy Nosferatu here, a Vrykolakis um, meta level 8 small energy Nosferatu to help keep things running. And as you can see, we are quite comfortably cap stable here with everything running. And as I said, most of the time, the afterburner is not going to be running, so you can just leave that shield booster running with impunity, as you'll see in a moment. The final mid slot then is an auto salvager. I've just gone for a dust auto salvager, 10 kilometer optimal range. This really isn't necessary at all, you know? Like you can just have the loot window open and just loot things whilst you're doing it. But I just think that it really plays into the semi AFK function of this. You just kind of hit orbit on stuff um, and then just let your uh, catalyst rip it to pieces and the auto salvager will just pick it up. Also, tell me what else I should put in there. Maybe, yeah, this is where I could put a scram, have a scram and two webs and be completely overkill in PvE tackle. If you want to put a scram in there, drop one of the stasis Weber fires. For me, I quite like the fact that a dust auto salvager, which I picked up in the event for those points, 10 kilometer range is plenty for me. I'd love to have the skills to have this at longer range, um, but for now, you know what? It gets the job done. I'm still completely capacitor stable, and as you'll see in the combat demonstration in just a moment, it allows me to pretty much just not worry about looting and still scoop up all of that yummy, yummy grey loot, either for reprocessing um, and sail onwards that way, or heck, if in certain cases, just for, you know, using. <laughs> okay, no one really uses the Grey Loop. It's for reprocessing and selling on the market, let's be completely honest. Anyway, with all of that said and done then, let's actually showcase this one in action, because it, I'm Captain Benzi and PvE and Destroyers is what I like doing. Now come on, if nothing else, you cannot tell me that that visual of a catalyst in full upright orbit here, pummeling snub-nosed railguns into the sight of a pirate battleship and winning doesn't warm your heart. That's why I do this. And I know people sit there and say, you know, Benzi, you're crazy. Why are you doing uh, PvP as a PvE? In destroyers, there are much better options out there. For me, because it's fun. It's just hilariously good fun. You can see there, down goes that battleship. The auto uh, looter is about to get that as well. I'm not about to loot that myself. Pling! That's nice, didn't even have to worry about that. Lock on, close the gap with the first target. Single cycle, or in this case, double cycle there of the afterburner just to get into range and leave everything else running. Just turn the afterburner off once I'm in range and you'll see that we don't actually take all that much damage here at all. I'm just looking here, 
to see what these other ships are doing. So we've got the Talwar 2 there with its scram on, and we've got the probe hitting me with the target painter. That target painter is a bit of a problem because it means I'm taking more damage than I would like to, but as you'll see, we can quite comfortably handle that. This is what I love about the Catalyst 3 Interdictor. Watch that probe there. One hit, two hit, gone. It is, it's down in seconds. I'm just going to change that from distance to names to make it a little bit easier. It is so quick at pulling down small ships like you would not believe. And you might be thinking, hang on, Benzi, you've taken some damage there on your armor. Is this, this shows that this isn't viable. You're in an Angel Small 10 anomaly here, and you're hitting the armor on a shield tank ship. What's going on? Well, no, I just completely forgot to try and turn the afterburner off and spent entirely too long uh, closing the gap with a battleship that was at 30 kilometers away during the first wave, and I took that tiny bit of damage. And as you'll see, I don't really take anything else. You thin the herd so quickly, the shield booster keeps things topped up so nicely and comfortably, that as long as you're actually maintaining those orbits and cycling the afterburner just to close the gap when you need to. You see, I'll quickly put it on and immediately turn it off, deactivate it, just so I boost into the one kilometer range, start orbiting and, you know, opening fire on whatever it is I'm shooting at. Ultimately, it just, to me, this is crazy how well this works. And the fact that I can take this into Angel, uh, like Inquisitors and Scouts, I think you can probably even clear a Dead Space 7 with this. Um, I haven't actually had the guts to try that one yet, but you can definitely do 7 Inquisitor and 7 Scout with this no trouble at all, like genuinely no trouble. So you might even be able to pull out 8s and 9s, uh, uh, Inquisitor and Scouts 8s, which are pretty good isk in that. That's not bad at all. All. And now that we're down to just two ships here, I'm orbiting that hurricane and you can see there goes my shield all the way back up and do spend a moment just to have a look at my capacitor and see how that's sitting at 70 odd percent as well with a shield booster on a full cycle. This, this ship is just going nowhere. We are going nowhere here. We're almost back up at full shield. The capacitor is not dropping below sort of 75 percent really. In fact, I think it's about to go above 80 percent. It's just crazy. It's just crazy. So if you've ever been a fan of the Catalyst and you're just a little bit disappointed you don't get to use it these days, yeah, you can. You can clear out small Tech 10 anomalies in about 18 to 20 minutes. This one took me, I think, 20 minutes. Um, I think it's about 19.45 by the time I finished this. Um, and I, as I said, I actually pulled some mistakes in that as well. I have done faster, down to about the 18 minutes, I think, is my best time clearing smalls. Can a battleship do it faster? Yes, but a battleship is also like nine times the cost. Um, so there's that, and this is just more fun for me to do. It also means that if someone happens to jump into system, you get a lot of people just see there and, oh, there's people in system here, I'm going to jump in with my interceptor and see what's happening, at which point I can grab them and kill them, which the battleship can't. So there's that as well. Now, you see, for some reason there, I did actually manually loot that, <laughs> but hey, off we go. Closing in on that Gist Typhoon now, um, and just... I don't know. There's a part of me that my heart is just singing at the fact that here I am in a destroyer clearing tech level 10 content again, comfortably having fun with it. And I know that I can quite easily just dock up, change a couple of modules around and I'm ready for PVP as well. My cargo hold actually does have a couple um, of uh, stacks of fuel in there just to keep things you know, ready in case I do need to run out and join a gate camp or something. So you can have a lot of fun with this. And to me, that's just exceptional. People complaining that destroyers are in a terrible place. These are fun. Yeah, I'd like to see something like Abyssal Dead Spaces added to the game, um, that sort of destroyer-centric content added, but uh, there's just so much you can now do with these. Yeah, they're not the covert ops. To me, they're actually better because they're a bit more versatile and a lot more fun to fly. And I flew the covert ops quite a lot back in the day. Anyway, folks, this is basically just me waxing lyrical about how happy I am to be flying destroyers in Tech 10 content again and actually doing it well. So I'm going to sign off here and just enjoy watching this catalyst with its like energy trails there orbiting this Typhoon too. That's just such a satisfying image right there as well. Anyway, folks, let me know your thoughts and opinions on this one in the comment section down below. It's excellent to be making Destroyer Pilot Manifesto videos again. Of course, I will be covering the other three. Um, you might be watching this in the future having watched those, but this is the first one of the four that I'm filming. I will be coming back with the Thrasher, the Coercer, and the Cormorant Interdictor as well, because I think they all have different playstyles and do things particularly well. But if you like warping to zero and just a 
obliterating everything with fast firing railguns, while the Catalyst 3 Interdictor really is a lot of fun. So anyway, let me know what you think folks, happy sailing, and see you in New Eden!